It is August, the middle of the dry season, and Malcolm Douglas and his companions, now three days from the nearest road, are battling overland into the western Kimberley of North Australia. Malcolm, with his intense interest in the bush and a continuing thirst for adventure, has embarked upon a most amazing journey. He hopes to explore the length of the rugged Charnley River Gorge, an endeavour that never before has been attempted. The Charnley River runs through one of the most remote and inaccessible regions of Australia. It's an area that has fascinated Malcolm for years. Using five and a half metre Roscoe canoes, Malcolm Douglas, Sean Dixon and two local Aborigines will spend weeks struggling through the gorge into the most awe-inspiring and spectacular country that Malcolm has ever seen. The chasm is so long and so deep that not even the local tribes ever attempted this journey. The rock jams, rapids, waterfalls and the sheer magnitude of the terrain make progress agonisingly slow and arduous. The success of the expedition will depend largely on survival techniques, hunting and food gathering skills. After the most physically demanding experience that Malcolm's ever endured, they reach the sea, where outriggers, sails and outboards are fitted to the canoes, and the hazardous voyage along the coast and to the outlying reefs begins. The expedition, full of drama, excitement and danger, will span two months. Canoes in the Kimberley takes you on another great Malcolm Douglas adventure. After days of bush bashing, they finally locate the Charnley River and the canoes, transported all the way from Sydney, are unloaded. Malcolm's arranged for a helicopter to bring out a driver to pick up the Toyota and he'll retrieve it later from a nearby cattle station. Malcolm's Aboriginal friends, Narragin tribesmen, Uggerman and Jomery, experts in tribal law, roamed this region in the early days. Hunting spears are prepared before the journey begins. In the early morning light, the canoes are loaded and Malcolm's kelpie, Jowdy, is rather apprehensive. Five hundred metres above sea level, the Charnley ripples gently towards the gorge. It's now four months since the last rains. The river is low, and Malcolm soon realises that this will be a slow trip. Kimberley is a vast expanse of ancient impassable mountain ranges where the rivers drop to the sea through long eroded gorges. During the wet season they gush 20 metres deep but in the dry many of the smaller streams cease to flow. The Charnley, one of the biggest of the Kimberley rivers, runs all through the year. Freshwater crocodiles are normally shy and timid but this one charges Malcolm when he expects it to retreat. Jomery can't resist a feed, and this black headed python will make a good meal. The 
snake feels fat, it will be good to eat. The scales, singed in the flames, are easily scraped off, and the meat is roasted in the coals and hot sand. It tastes like chicken. Towards the end of the week, the first sheer cliffs appear. The gorge is not far off. Freshwater crocs lie sunning themselves on the sandbanks. Although they don't normally attack humans, they must be treated with respect. In the deeper water holes between the rock bars, there's always plenty of fresh food. Traditionally, freshwater turtles are located underwater, hiding beneath fallen timber and debris. They were an important dry season food for the tribes, rich in fat and protein and easily located in the dwindling streams. The catch, to be eaten later in the day, is buried alive in the sand, upside down to prevent escape. A delicacy found in the remote northern rivers is the long feelered prawn, an easy prey for jomery and Agamemnon. Commonly called cherubin. They're superb eating. Turtles are always cooked in the shell to ensure that the flesh is juicy and free of sand. As they approach the entrance to the chasm, the first of many obstacles confronts them. Huge boulders jam the river. For the next three weeks, Malcolm and his party physically haul all their gear and canoes over dozens of these massive obstructions. The canoes slide easily over the smooth rocks, but many of the blockades take hours to negotiate as everything is carried from one deep hole to the next. The Charnley, during the wet season, a raging torrent, is one of the great white water rivers of Australia. But as soon as the rains cease, the river drops and in many places flows in narrow gutters between the boulders. Jowdy, now reveling in the trip, often happily hitches a ride. The deep pools between the jams give a brief but welcome respite from the demanding task of portage. This freshie, his upper jaw healing from a recent injury, is a pathetic sight. Old and inquisitive, he's no threat to the paddlers.
for the first time, the Charnley enters a long, deep water hole. The Pandanus line banks, home of the raucous flying foxes. Nocturnal animals, they hate to be disturbed. Uggerman is most concerned. Big dangerous saltwater crocs may have travelled up river to feed on the bats. A croc surfaces and Uggerman, taking no chances, moves it on. A ghoul's goanna, called Bungaras in Western Australia, threatens defiantly as the canoes pass. When the Kimberley tribes roamed this wild country, they travelled along the top of the gorge, staying well clear of the sheer cliffs. The men toiled all day over many of the more formidable rock jams. The waters teem with fish, predominantly the sooty grunter, called black brim by the locals. They bite so frantically, it's just a matter of dropping a baited line. Fish are caught each day for lunch. Bush flies, a constant source of irritation, are particularly bad during the hottest part of the day. At times, the water holes are so far apart, the canoes are manhandled all day. Uggerman and Jomery are always on the lookout for fat crocodiles to be cooked later at the overnight camp. Shallow rapids are frustrating. The canoes jam between the small rocks. With a crocodile already in the bag, this one has a lucky reprieve. Uggerman tells Malcolm that this cliff will be a good spot to look for the nest of the wild bee. A search among the rocks reveals the small wax-lined entrance to the hive. The honey-laden comb is well underground. The tiny fly-like bee is unable to sting. The native bee's honey was always an important part of the Aborigines' diet, especially for the children. 
It's rich and very sweet. One of Malcolm's favorite bush foods. A species of softwood tree growing nearby was of vital importance to the Aborigines. The small dead branches were collected and carried in bundles for fire lighting. Agaman prepares a ground oven and the men begin the age-old ritual of making fire. The end of the longest straight stick is rounded and smoothed. Dry kangaroo dung is powdered onto tender dry grass. And a thicker piece of wood, scraped flat and grooved, is held firmly. This classic survival technique is now rarely utilised. It's a team effort. As the stick is rotated, downward pressure must be applied. Right. In a minute or two, the powdered wood smoulders, overflowing onto the kangaroo dung. Right. Care must be taken to coax the spark into flame. Selected hardwood is charred and stones heated to cook a crock. The crocodile is laid upon a bed of embers. The hot stones are replaced and the paper bark covered with sand retains the heat for hours. This method of cooking keeps the flesh tender and moist. The going gets tougher as the days pass and they move deeper into the wilderness. The river, now so languid and low, will thunder down the chasm throughout the monsoon season. Malcolm has never been in such awe-inspiring country. He believes that one day this region will be recognised as one of the great wonders of Australia and should be classified as a national park. At times, better progress is made detouring away from the river up onto high ground. It takes all day to move the canoes along this rock shelf. 
worn smooth by countless wet season floods. In these situations, all valuable equipment is unloaded. It's now two weeks since the trip down the river began. The physical effort of each day's endeavour exhausts the men and an overnight camp is made wherever there's a soft sandbank. And bed is any stretch of flat ground where you can roll out your swag. As the day closes, the timeless grandeur and vivid colours of this remote wilderness are washed by the last rays of the setting sun. Day after day, they push slowly towards the coast. This region, the far west Kimberley, is so inaccessible that few Australians are aware of its unique beauty. The river drops quickly for several kilometres and when Jomery spots a fork-tailed catfish, he's convinced that the salt water is not far off. The descent is rugged. This waterfall must be bypassed. If a canoe gets away, it could fracture. Malcolm is already planning an attempt on the gorge in the wet season. He's keen to explore the river in full flood. As the days pass and there's still no sign of the sea, the river twists and turns and the rock jams become even more numerous. Progress is frustratingly slow. Malcolm, sensing a change in the river, tries for a barramundi. Elated, he knows that the salt water must be close. Everyone is keen now to reach the sea, after being for so long locked in the gorge. But the immense chasm is never ending. Ahead, yet another rock bar.
Sean looks for a way through, and quite unexpectedly, there's a slight change in the watercolour. They have come at last to the uppermost reaches of tidal influence. From now on, fresh water will be precious, and all the containers are filled. The collapsible plastic water bottles hold 20 litres. Malcolm's canoe is lowered for the first time into brackish water. This is the home of the big barramundi. Jomari and Agamon, in eager anticipation, have the oven ready. And cooked this way, there's no washing up. Any fish not eaten are salted and sun-dried. Under a nearby rock overhang where Aborigines once camped, Jomari wants to leave a reminder of their journey through the gorge. White clay, the Aborigines' traditional painting pigment, is chewed to a paste and the travellers leave their mark. The Aborigines left these prints as a personal record of their passage through an area. Throughout Australia, the once common ancient ochre stencils are rapidly fading into oblivion. Heading back to the canoes, Jomari fires the spin effects. He's hoping that the black smoke will be seen far to the east and his wife and relatives will know he's safe. Descending to the estuary, the river changes dramatically from the fresh running water of the gorge to salt mud flats, and a determined last effort gets the canoes through. For the first time in weeks, they camp on the plains, giving Agamon a chance to hunt kangaroo. After removal of the entrails, the small incision in the stomach is closed with a pointed stick. The meat is prepared in the traditional way. The fur is singed off. Then the tail is removed and roasted separately. After several hours in the ground oven, it's ready. Kangaroo is a most favoured meat of the Aborigines. Mm. 
Jomari cleans and shapes the forelimb bone of the roux to make a special tool. A bottle washed up on the tide is broken into sections with hot sand. Bottles were once highly prized for making spear tips and Jomari is still able to manufacture these deadly artifacts. The hot sand breaks the glass in a straight line. In pre-European days, before the introduction of glass, selected stone was used. The kangaroo bone is employed to methodically apply pressure while the paper bark cushions the glass and catches the minute slivers to be carefully disposed of later. Skill and patience are needed as the glass is brittle. The tip is painstakingly shaped. Several hours completes the task and it's ready to be fixed to a spear. When a victim is hit, the serrated edges splinter off and the slivers, which cannot be extracted from the wound, cause a slow and painful death. Petrol, sails, outriggers and outboard motors left at a rendezvous two months earlier are now retrieved and the canoes take on a completely different appearance. They have become seagoing craft. Still 60 kilometres from the open sea and with the tide dropping off for the next seven days, they have only a few minutes to launch their canoes, just after sunup as the waters reach top tide. Jowdy balks at the thick, oozing mud. The party, now in the uppermost reaches of Walcott Inlet, must paddle downstream to where the motors can be started. Without the outriggers and motors, it would be too dangerous to push on. Ahead is weeks of travelling on the open sea, along the Kimberley coast, to finish at the town of Derby. On the falling tide, jumping mullet hug the shallows, living in constant terror of larger fish. At the slightest hint of danger, they panic. The graceful pelicans come in for a feed. Walcott Inlet soon opens out into a wide, muddy waterway. Jomari and Uggerman are from an inland tribe and dislike the sea. Uggerman has never been on the salt water before and feels happier huddled in under the spray cover, strapped into a life jacket. They're heading for Cockatoo Island, 120 kilometres down the coast. The outboards, a mere two horsepower, are amazingly efficient, pushing the heavily laden canoes along at seven kilometres an hour. Five litres of petrol per motor lasts all day. The small tanks are refilled every hour or so. Fortunately, the sea is calm, and two days later at the small mining community on Cockatoo Island, Uggerman and Jomari are farewelled. They're apprehensive of leaving the mainland, so Malcolm has arranged for a charter plane to take them home. Malcolm and Sean head for the little-known outlying islands and reefs. The weather is perfect. Even today, reliable charts are still unavailable for this part of the Kimberley coast. The reefs exposed at low tide can be covered by 12 metres of water six hours later. When the tide turns, the sharks and turtles move over the reef feeding.
This coastline experiences one of the biggest tide variations in the world, rushing over the sand flats at an almost unbelievable speed. A fantastic layer of foam is churned up by the rushing waters. Malcolm, one of the few people who knows this area well, is keen to reach a particular high point, his favourite fishing spot. Malcolm's after a feed. The lure hits the water and instantly fighting Trevally home in. But this one's just too big a meal for two people. Malcolm, keen to show Sean the great numbers of fish now on the reef, removes the hooks from a lure and trolls it quickly, close to the stern. The water explodes with frantically lunging trevally. a good sized fish to eat. Without warning, a pack of sharks arrives, ripping a hooked fish to shreds. These are black tip reef sharks, cruising the reef in search of victims. Sean's line tangles around the outrigger, the sharks, excited by the blood, are in a feeding frenzy. Sean, a keen fisherman, is stunned. He's never seen sharks as aggressive as these. Malcolm and Sean pull in their lines and the sharks, still ravenous, attack the small plastic outboard propeller and they're big enough to cause serious damage. When a big shark appears, it's time to leave. Turtles, too, make a dash for safer waters. The tide drops as quickly as it rose, and soon the water is gone. Only the deep channels are still gushing. Malcolm and Sean must determine the best way off the reef. The incredible tidal variation makes the whole region marked as Montgomery Reef on nautical maps too hazardous for bigger boats. And so, few people ever see this amazing phenomenon. Malcolm and Sean head for their island camp along the channels where the bigger marine creatures find shelter at low tide. It's time to move on. And in the morning, the long journey to Derby begins. A 
over a week of constant traveling lies ahead. 200 kilometers down King Sound. Sail is used whenever winds are favorable. Malcolm believes that the cliff-lined shores, the rocky islands, superb dry season climate, and the brilliant natural colors will in the future make this region famous. The huge tides make camping difficult. At the end of each day, the canoes must be stored well above high water mark. For the first time since leaving the Charnley Gorge, the winds are up. Late in the day, while seeking shelter close to the rocks, one of the outriggers is damaged. Waiting for the winds to ease, Sean patches the cracks with fiberglass. A welcome change of diet is offered by an abundant supply of oysters covering the surrounding rocks. But the winds increase, and it's too dangerous to continue. Malcolm, with years of experience, watches the water for hours. He knows how quickly these seas can change, especially when tide and wind are opposing forces. In the morning, it's calmer, and a decision is made to reach the shelter of the many rocky islands. These islands are among the most spectacular in Australia. Helpman Island, halfway down King Sound, is one of the breeding grounds of the green turtles. Sean and Malcolm are delayed again by the rising winds. Turtles, oblivious of their visitors, complete their nesting. It's been a long night, and this one's anxious to return to the sea. At low tide, with the canoes now positioned well below the sandy nesting grounds, they prepare for the longest and most dangerous reach of the journey. From here on, the inhospitable shores are mangrove lined and offer no shelter. Malcolm and Sean must remain in their canoes until they reach Derby. All afternoon, they run with the tide down King Sound. The brilliant, multicolored islands are now far behind. Malcolm and Sean travel through the night to finish their journey at the Derby Pier. For Malcolm, this has been one of his greatest adventures.